Uh, let's talk a little bit about you and, and uh, see now you, where did you start out your life? You were born and raised in the country? Uh, yeah, the I, was, I was raised on a, on a farm. In fact, I live in the same neighborhood in which I grew up. It was my grandfather's um, farm. Part, part of it was divided into thirds. But in 1939, my grandfather was an obstetrician in Norfolk. He was also in the Naval Reserves. He was in charge of military intelligence uh, in, in uh, Norfolk, which is the largest military naval complex in the world. So I was born in the Naval Hospital, which is, was the NATO headquarters, uh -huh. um, and brought home to my grandparents' farm. Um, my father was in the South China Seas on a, on a naval vessel. My uncle was in the Navy. So I come from a long line of, of military civilian uh, folks. They, they were not full-time uh, uh, military individuals. They, they had jobs, and they would go into the war. They would be in reserves. And uh, as my grandfather was, he stayed in mm -hmm. um, and retired uh, a Navy captain. But I live um, in a house that was in part of my grandfather's field. And, right? Yeah. That's, that's very interesting. But I'm, I'm being strangled financially uh, by um, the, this Army intelligence group, JAG group, that my husband... Um, no, JAG. Is, is that J-A-G? JAG, Judge Advocate General. Um, I think American citizens do not realize how many JAGs are in our court system, and they take orders. They are in the chain of command, they're active reserve, and they are in our court system everywhere you look. Not, not just federal, uh, state, local? local and everywhere, yeah. And they're going to um, meetings once a month. And if there is a case, uh, like many of the military intelligence wives, like myself, and we have information that would come out in a, in a divorce hearing or, or whatever, um, they totally control it. It is uh, Judge John Moore, in, in my case, um, in Virginia Beach, is, a, is an Army Ranger. His, um, he is um, active reserve. He's a VMI Army Colonel. He's a graduate of VMI. In Virginia Beach, in the courts, there are at least six judges, and I'm, I'm including commissioners in that, because in Virginia we have a system where the commissioners do the, um, the, uh, a lot of the decisions. And all of these in Virginia Beach uh, who take care of military wives mm -hmm. are military judges. No, you, you, you mentioned the term VMI. What, what is that? Well, VMI is Virginia Military Institute, and it's where uh, General Marshall, the Marshall Plan, went, went to school. It's a, it's a little West Point. Mm -hmm. it's, it, there's a lot of tradition there, uh, but it's based on um, the Greek sort of Spartan military concept. And my father went to Washington and Lee, which is also in Lexington, and I know that there is uh, some sort of, um, I won't say cult, but there, there probably is some sort of um, club, secret society. Uh, okay. And uh, so it's very, very tight click. Um, but what I was trying to say is that the, the judges are military men, and they're not independent. They, they take they orders. They take orders. They're on, there's a chain of command. And in my particular case and the other 11 military wives that, who, whom I have met so far, there are many, many more, but they've all been handled the same way. That's mm -hmm. not, not, not a normal divorce uh, at all. You know, I've, I've heard of these kind of situations before, but never, it's never been put so concisely and so reasonably that there would be a, a connection why some people just 
no matter what attorney you have, it doesn't matter. Oh, no. The, the divorces and the settlements of assets never go the right way. No, and there's a FISA court, uh, which I know is involved oh. in, in my case. What, what, what kind of court? Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act. It's a Justice Department secret court that American citizens are not aware of. There have been a couple of articles on it. Um, it it's a small group of, of men, and I think there's a woman on it. Um, I, I believe there's seven justices. And in reality, the, the article that I read, which was given to me by um, Mike Fuller, and I know he would not mind me using his name, He's a, a government assassin. He was a, um, what, like my husband, a, a government assassin who uh, did... Uh, when you say assassin, you're talking like character assassination or kill people? No, killing people. Okay. He, he was, he's a mercenary, government mercenary. Okay. Um, he was in Afghanistan and in uh, Rhodesia, South Africa. And I met him uh, and his wife through Sarah McClendon. He's a okay. real wonderful patriot who is speaking out about what the, the NATO community and, and the uh, Army and Marine Corps are, are doing. And Sarah McClendon, she's, uh, she's an old war horse, isn't she? <laughs> Sarah saved my life, literally. Really? Yeah. I, uh, I had been having break-ins starting um, Mar the, the night of March the 4th, after I was calling everywhere to see um, if I could find my husband, he would, you know, disappear at times. And I, uh, I, I found my husband's diary, which I have here, which they have been not anxious to have um, get out. Uh-huh. Now, uh, they, they meaning? The... Well, they, um, General Sheehan, General uh, Krulak, uh, Marine Corps colonels, um, excuse me, generals, um, uh, Al Gray, um, Cook, um, and especially General Joy. Joy. Uh, General Jim Joy uh -huh. and General Carl Steiner are, they're evil men. Um, and they are in this diary meeting with my husband almost every day in Beirut. They trained the, the men in black mm -hmm. who, who killed those people in Waco. It was General Joy and General Ste Steiner. Steiner's army, dirty tricks, special operations. And this is what my husband does for a living is train mercenaries, young boys from countries like Romania, um, Cuba, I mean uh, uh, Dominican Republic, Haiti, all these countries. They're training them to be murderers and the taxpayers' dollars are paying for this. Okay, now they train them just through the normal channels of the military. They, these kids uh, join the Army of the Marine Corps and then they select these kids based on some criteria to train them? They, they psychologically profile them. The profile, which is similar to my husband's and Lee Harvey Oswald's and McVeigh's and, and some of the others um, who were all part of this program, Daimler, Jeffrey Daimler was profiled and hidden. You know, they... Um, what, what most Americans do not know is that all of these men were oh, Jeffrey Dahmer, he has a mi military background? Of course. They're oh. all Army. Oh, okay. They were all picked out because they're perverted or twisted. Oh. Yeah. Sexually perverted. Sexually perverted and therefore, you know... Yeah. Well, now, I, I don't think McVeigh was, was uh, perverted the way Dahmer was, but uh -huh. certainly... The, the group that my husband is overseeing are mm -hmm. twisted. So they, part of the criteria, they look for people who have got something in their history that gives them a, a weird bend. Yeah. Uh, like they, the, they were molested when they were a child, yeah. or they come from dysfunctional families, abuse, whatever. Strong mother, 
uh, weak father, no father, poor. Because these guys are looking for security, so they will stay in the military and do anything okay. for that security. This was my husband's scenario. My husband and Oswald are just two peas in a pod. Huh. Um, exactly the same personality, the same type, in the same elite group, I might add, which was doing work with communists and Russians, with Czechoslovakians and with um, Romanians. I met assassins, I met drug lords, Fahim Kordabawi, um, whose family were the drug lords in the Bekha Valley. Um, I mean, he, 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 he knows the elite of the elite of the elite, and, and that's why um, I was warned uh, twice not to talk. And you were warned? Uh I was told that I would be killed. I was told that your I husband warned you about this, or oh, my husband warned me early on in it. But he knew that um, he he loved me in the beginning. I'm I'm sure he really did. But he's he's a robot, my husband, except when he's drinking, and I, I think that's why he he drank because the first three years of marriage, he was telling me everything. And I come from a very strong Protestant Southern culture, which, you know, when you're talking about shooting people like ducks, it, I, I, the only thing I can relate it to is my brother's going duck hunting, and that's what George would tell me it was like. Uh -huh. Killing is just, you know, it's nothing. There's no emotion involved. You just, it's, you, you just get rid of somebody. And he said he was an existentialist and that these murders were necessary. And, you know, it very matter of fact. And I'd sort of go, uh-huh, yep. And we'd be, we'd be eating dinner. And I was trying to get him to be, to, to know Christ, you know, to, to sort of understand a little bit about uh -huh. my, my background and America's background. But he, uh, his group are, they are not Christians, they're, they're what he calls existentialist, uh -huh. and they study uh, German um, Clausewitz and Nietzsche, Sartre, Camus, uh, Montesquieu. And his thesis at Princeton, which was written for him by a very good friend of his named Todeve, who was a French count, um, and his thesis was on this. Hmm. And it was supposedly it was in French, but my French is better than his, so he could not have written that by himself. I know that. I know it was written for him. But in the intelligence world, um, and in the communist world, in the um, world that my husband was in, um, one had to know French because all of the the terrorist trainers and the um, the guys who were funding all the guerrillas and everything were in Paris mm. and New Orleans. They, they would go back and forth. Still, the 4th Marines is, is out of New Orleans. And that's been going on a long time, ever since Disraeli, uh, even before, I think. But they had hit squads and, um, you know, undercover groups in New Orleans. And George would go to New Orleans, all the Marines. I mean, they, this is where they train, do terrorist training, Lake Pontchartrain, and places like that. Okay, and then this would be during the 1980s? Um, yeah, 1980s. Okay. From the 19, I think New Orleans has been uh, a school for a place where um, debauchery and murder and cults and flourish uh -huh. yeah well uh, there's a new orleans connection with the the jf kennedy assassination well you see oswald my husband and oswald were in the same club general uh, jim joy is in that club general louis buell who is my husband's benefactor or whatever you want to call it um is in that club there is a um in fact i've got the name of um they're, they're Russians in that club. Yeah, feel free to grab any uh, reference materials. Yeah. Got her. What, I, what I want to tell you about General Al Gray, my okay. husband was the chief of staff 
for um, General Al Gray, who was the Commandant of the Marine mm -hmm. Corps. And I probably shouldn't say this on the tape, and you all can uh, mm -hmm. get rid of it, but he's a homosexual. Gray. Gray. Okay. He's a, what they call a cherry Marine. Now, I'm not anti... Um, I'm trying to find my... Um, I hope I've got it. Yeah, here it is. Um, the... Now, this Vietnam term, cherry, War, cherry marine, cherry is that marine. A, that's a common phrase that, <laughs> it's in the military. <laughs> it's, see, the thing is, I, you know, they're guys and they're girls, and I just came from such a, uh, a real prudish culture. Yeah. You know. That's fine. You came from a normal culture. I, and, and I'm not, not judging them, but they, um, the Vietnam War, I know a lot about that about the Max Sog program and the Phoenix program because George was involved with a very important part of that. Not important, really, but he, um, he and Al Gray and Louis Buell and Michael O'Boyle and um, Ollie Whipple um, were do you remember the Manguez and the um, Pueblo? Was it the, the... Oh, the seizure of that little ship? Yes. Yeah. Uh -huh. This was... It's, it's run by the mob then. It was, it was a mob military uh, partnership, joint. It was a joint operation in Korea and in Vietnam. The highest levels of the Marine Corps and the Army in those special operations levels, the, the individuals are actually in the mob. New You're Jersey, talking about the mafia type mob? I'm talking about the Brooklyn, New Jersey mob. My husband, Al Gray, Sheehan, they're all Brooklyn. Cap, Cap Weinberger. Um, the Heinz Kissinger, there's the Boston mob, which was shipping weapons back and forth to Northern Ireland. Um, and I don't want to get too deeply involved in that, but it goes, Israel, some of the, the Zionists who came over from Germany, according to my husband, were, um, see, he works with those people. The, they do a lot of money laundering in, in the banks cash transactions for the drugs that they're bringing over mm -hmm. uh, through Latin America, the, the Southern Mafia, the Dixie Mafia, which is now my husband's involved with in, in Miami. The military are all involved once they retire. They're, um, you know, they go into this drug and secondary weapons sales. And um, before I forget, I want to uh, find the name of this um, Russian who worked with uh, Al Gray, who was my husband's boss. And I'm trying to see where I where I wrote it. Um, I may have to look and find that another. It's no trouble at all. How are we doing over there, guys? Sound good? We're, how much time is that rolled on the clock? On your clock? You can speak. So. 20 minutes. 20? Okay, good. I, I can't find it right now. I'll find it. No. Um, the uh, Vietnam was really important uh, because a lot of experiments were done on boys who went over there. Mm -hmm. I had, since my husband disappeared and since I, they have been um, psychologically um, trying to destroy me, financially trying to destroy me, uh, because I'm telling the truth, the, his first wife, I know, was murdered. Okay. She was, um, according to a psychiatrist whose name I probably won't give because he's an honorable man. Um, I was given permission before I went public mm -hmm. with Sarah McClendon at the press club 
anonymously, but they knew who I was on, on the uh, 3rd of July, 1996, was when I came out with a s small group of people. Um, but before that time, they, they were trying to handle me, to try and uh, get me to be quiet. They tried threatening me and so forth. Um, and I'm trying to remember where, where I was, what I was going to, the point I was going to make. Um, I can't remember now what I was going to, ah. okay. it was something important. Oh, yeah, General Jim Joy. Yeah. Um, I called General Jim Joy on the phone. I was trying to find where my husband was because I didn't know whether I'd have any money to, you know, food to eat or what. He just walked away, and I knew that the Marine Corps knew where he was. But I was being handled psychologically. Um, on the 4th of March, my home was broken into. They had elaborate plans to handle me. The 4th of March, 96? 1996. 96. And keep in mind, he had disappeared on the 28th of December. Of 96. Of 90, yeah, 96, 95. Okay, uh-huh. So put yourself in my shoes. Um, I have no idea where he is. He's done this before. But, and each time I was totally traumatized. Um, so I get... Well, what happened during this break-in? Well, they were looking for the diary, which I have here. Okay. Um, I don't have the original copy, but th this is the diary. Okay. Can you lift it up? So yeah, can, sure. Yeah, just... This is, this is it. It's his Beirut diary. Kind of hold those. So yeah. Mm -hmm. this, this is it. Okay. And it's in his handwriting. Um, the Beirut diary tells how the... Um, intelligence community, the um, Army and Marine Corps assassins, snipers, are uh, how, how they operate in a city during a crisis. My husband was the, the liaison between the White House and President Jamal. So he, my husband is a friend of Skrokoff, McFarland's a Marine, all of these men are personal friends of Georgia's. Colby, I spoke with personally on the phone. Two weeks later, he was murdered. Um, he went to Princeton. My husband knew him. He knew my husband. Um, he told me, uh, Colby told me that... Now this is General Colby? No, this is William Colby, who was head of the CIA. Oh, okay, yeah. Who was murdered in a... Uh, So-called building I, accident. I know exactly how that happened because... You see, the SEAL teams, SEAL Team 6, mm -hmm. uh, 4, 6, and 8 are on the East Coast, and then the odd numbers are on the West Coast. And some of the people who are affiliated with the SEALs mm -hmm. <laughs> um, I shouldn't say that. I'm not going to say it. But well, are, are you, it, it wouldn't be hard for a seal to, to come from underwater and tip the boat over and make sure the man's dead, that sort of thing? The Israelis train with the seals. They do a lot of wet ops murders okay. over here because of some sort of arrangement. The, the young boys, I met um, three young assassins on a bus going up back and forth to Sarah as I went on the bus mm -hmm. because they were sabotaging my car so often. So I uh, sat next to two young assassins, one from Romania, one from Haiti. And I let them know that I understand, you know, how it is. And this little boy cried. The, the, I, wouldn't, I won't mention which, which one it was because it may get back to him. But... He told me it was the same scenario. His mother, he lives on $850 a month. Now, these are mercenaries working. The taxpayers are paying mercenaries. The taxpayers are paying young men who are not citizens of the United States to kill innocent people, women and children. They get on a flight from 
Norfolk and Oceana. Mm -hmm. They fly to Stuttgart, and I was told this. This is this is what they do. Then they go by a special helicopter to countries like uh, Turkey, like um, the part of Iraq, to uh, uh, um, Algeria, to parts of Africa, and they do wet ops. They'll just, you know, murder five, ten, twenty people, and then they blame it on the Arabs, or they blame it on somebody else, but it's actually NATO rogue assassins, because there are men from Australia, uh, South Africa, uh, Britain, that I've been able to determine, and a lot of these other little countries that are, are sort of wanting to get into, um, into NATO who are, they have little boys that they pick out, and they call them special. They use the word special, meaning elite, irregular, in order to entice these boys because they don't have much ego. Mm -hmm. So if you call being a criminal, in other words, they are protected. They know that they are above the law. That's what they, my husband's above the law. Judge John Moore is above the law. Colonel Barry Cantor, my husband's JAG colonel lawyer, is above the law. Um, Grover Wright, Marine Corps. All of these, a lot of these guys who were judges had their wives gotten rid of. Judge John Moore had his first wife uh, thrown into a mental institution before he became a judge. He battered her. He, and, and I spoke with a, a man who has a purple heart who, two people who knew Hannah very well. And Hannah Moore was deeply in love with her husband. He got back from Vietnam. He was an army ranger. He battered her. He physically and psychologically abused her. And she started screaming, you know, mm -hmm. doing what I, because I was battered and bruised. <clears throat> A lot of wives are by these, these Vietnam vets. But if they're a colonel, or if they're a rising star, the wife has got to be crazy, because you, they've got too much invested mm -hmm. in these men. And it's a very small cult. Mm -hmm. I mean, they, I have heard the things that they do when they're colonels. It's some of the same things that they do in cap and gown, which is the Princeton version of Skull and Bones. My husband went to Princeton after he went to the Hun School for four years. Okay, now we should probably um, clarify a little bit about, you mentioned Skull and Bones, and many of the people wouldn't be familiar with that, and the cap and gown. So what, what are, these, uh, are these clubs that these young inductees are pulled into, secret societies? Secret societies. And, um, and again, is this to make them feel super special? Yes. And also put a control on them yes. so that you never tell these secrets? Yes. Uh -huh. That's it. You have got it. You know, I've, I've heard um, a lot of child molesters. I mean, people yes. who are not connected with the military, just plain old child molesters, will molest a child and then tell them, now, if you ever tell, you know, they'll take a cat and strangle it and kill it or something. This is what I'm going to do to your mother. This is yes. what I'll do to you. Yes. Bad things will happen if you ever tell. That's right. And children grow up uh, believing that I must never, ever tell. And they don't, generally. That's right. Unless someone comes along to help them. And you see, my husband is frightened to death. I believe that his brother was murdered to keep him in. Because he had gone through four years of this mind control. And the, the man who did it, I'll, I'll, you can see this on the video, his name was Charles Caddock and another man named Alexander Robinson. Okay, Charles Caddock. Caddock. And the other one? Alexander Robinson. Alexander Robinson was a Marine, very well-connected uh, Presbyterian family, mm -hmm. <clears throat> whose um, family member was the influential one who brought over the Saudis. The original Saudi 
head of Saudi Arabia was very, George told me all this um, about um, Mohammed Faisal, Khalid Faisal, and Saud Faisal, and there were something like 32 brothers of, of the, the then, in the, in the mid-50s, the, the ordained, you know, whoever was head of Saudi Arabia. It was actually the United States who chose that person because the United States, through Charles Caddock and that group, murdered the, the good one, the one who was, who, whom everybody liked, who was well-educated, and who was normal. In, I believe it was 1952, 1953, 1954, in Paris, the universal Saudi, the well-educated Saudi, was poisoned. And what was his name? Charles Caddock. Um, I don't suppose it's all that important, but anyway. I'm trying to remember. I think it was um, Fahim, or I. I he, he died in Paris, and so his brother, his half brother, or whatever, who was the father of all these 32 boys, and the three oldest now mm -hmm. were snuck into the United States. I'm. I have a degree in history, Virginia history, undergraduate degree and masters in Scottish history, and being a Southerner, we always look at, you know, past his prologue. And, um, and I jumped into the Saudi Arabian books to try and find out something about the Hun School, which is in Princeton, started by a physicist connected with Einstein and that group. So I was looking for the Hun School because I knew they went there. And they're in all the brochures. They're very proud to say, you know, we have the Saudi royals went here. President Cheeseboro brags about going over there and being wined and dined, and you know. So I, uh, I only found one reference, but it was a reference that said something like, they went to a, a prep school in the United States, that's all they said. Well, it was the Hun School, and my husband was one of the playmates. Um, Charles Caddock was the bodyguard, quote unquote, teacher mm -hmm. for these guys. So they would go out and play in the woods, and they were doing homosexual things with them. You know, I mean, they were, there was a lot of money. They bought a big house. Yeah. And so. Okay, now, I, I, I was momentarily distracted. Okay. Uh, explain to me a little bit about this, um, the homosexual event here. Well, George, for the first three years of our marriage, was drinking entirely too much. And he, he was trying to let me know about his world. And I'm not judging him. He's, he's a bisexual, Okay, And he, I need, he needed help. He needed help, he needed still love, does. he needed cry. He yeah. still does. Mm -hmm. He really needs help. And the handlers knew that I was changing him. I was taking him away t from this crazy mm -hmm. cult right. that he'd been in all these years. And I mean, we were going to church. He even walked down the aisle one time when Tony Evans preached at Scope. I mean, he was overwhelmed. And at Scope? No, at is Scope in Norfolk. It's a big auditorium. Okay. And so, um, but he was a little boy when he was, it, it's mind control. Uh, uh, MK Ultra, somebody said. They had a group of men, psychiatrists in New Jersey. I don't know where this place was, but they would go, and his, even his roommates in Princeton told me about it. George never, in, intentionally, he never introduced me to any of his friends. So I had to cold call all these people. I got their names and addresses, telephone numbers. I called all these roommates at the Hun School and at 
Princeton. Mm -hmm. They told me things about George and, you know, holding hands with, you know, with Caddick and other people about being a cheerleader and going off and, and so forth. Now, a cheerleader, this is a kind of a, a, a trade name, right? No, he was a, he was a cheerleader for the... Um, the at Princeton? At Princeton. Okay. And he traveled with the football team. Okay. And here is a guy like that. They put him in the Marine Corps. I don't think that was very nice. Do you know what I'm saying? Uh -huh. It was hard for him. But... But it was part of the... Part of the... The, the long-term vision. Absolutely. They wanted him long term, and it's because of the Saudis. This is what I believe, and what his roommate believes. Um, he had a roommate uh, at Princeton who was also at the Hun, who's a dear, dear, wonderful. Uh, his his mother his mother is is an Anglican. His father was a Jewish doctor from Brooklyn, and um, Jack is a dear. And we, we talk to each other a lot on the phone. Um, George sort of, you know, dismissed him because George was getting in with a, another crowd. George got into cap and gown, which is the same kind of fraternity. I mean, it's a, an eating club at Princeton uh -huh. uh, for intelligence officers. It's, it's cap and gown. Would they have anybody <clears throat> involved that wasn't intelligence oriented? Uh, football players and so forth. But I have a feeling that um, cap and gown has a lot of intelligence officers and uh, boys who may have been raped. Of course, they'd never talk about it. Right. But um, I know that the initiation is they get very drunk, and even in the Marine Corps they do that. It's called dining in. They have the shellback um, ceremony. They, they do a lot of um, homosexual enticement. The boys are, when they, when they come in, when they're new recruits, they strip them nude, they violate their personal parts. Um, there's a lot of that is going on, what about, even uh, now. Uh, tail hook? Yeah. Is there a connection? Yeah, sure, because this, the, the cream of the crop is, is doing this. They're having group sex parties. And that was a that was a Navy operation too, wasn't it? Yeah, and the, but the Navy and the Marine Corps. Of course not. Maybe we had maybe we had a for those <laughs> that's that, another that, that tail hook. They don't know anything about tail hook. Was uh, refresh our memories. Well, tail tail hook. In fact, I I when I was single in Norfolk, um, I I know one of the people who was deeply involved with Tailhook, who is, was the captain of the Saratoga, was very much involved with this kind of behavior, um, and um, I know a lot about the, see, I never, I never put I never thought about group sex. This is so awful for me to contemplate that these orgies are going on all over the Mediterranean, that the captains, lieutenants, the men who rise to the top are the ones who are picked to play the games, the pool parties, the nude pool parties. And they have the secretaries who come in. I've talked to three guys and, of course, my husband. Mm -hmm who who went to these parties. But they what they do is, and this is General Al Gray, who was the main prime mover, mm -hmm. um, they would go to a place like Es La Rose, where Charles Caddock, this teacher who inducted, uh -huh. got my husband into it, he retired in one of these all-male party houses in, on the Mediterranean. I mean, that's where he, and my husband kept up with him all through the years. And, and but I, the, these sex parties and orgies, they're all homosexual in nature, or well, is there some heterosexual? Off, they start off with, with the wild secretaries. It's kind of, you know, my husband did, did those in Indonesia. He did them at a place in, in uh, uh, northern Virginia with his first wife. I did not know any of this. Mm -hmm. I knew absolutely none of this when I married him. He told me he was loyal to his wife. 
he wanted me to think he was just apple pie because yeah. I'm I'm just a one man woman. Right. When I when I took that oath to marry him, right. love, honor, and obey, that's me. Um, but he, um, when he was married to his first wife, was just an, an addict. He was a sexual addict, an alcoholic addict. He loves, you know, terror, and his his whole little soul was just being sucked away from him desperately. And he really he needs Christ. He he needed he needed me day in and day out. He did not need to be what he's doing now is, is running more of these operations. You know, as you describe this I, I can't help but think of Bill Clinton. Well of course he was. He was one of those profile boys. Uh -huh. But the difference between Bill Clinton and I'm not saying Bill Clinton's better, but Bill Clinton did not go he didn't know anything about the assassinations. Bill Clinton when I was living with Sarah McClendon, the senior White House correspondent who saved my life, because she said, Mrs. Griggs, you get up here to Washington right now or you're dead. You're going to be dead. And I still feel as though I probably will be. Um, I'll certainly be financially ruined. Um, they are still doing uh, psychological operations in my home sabotaging my car, messing with my tele telephone, my radio. Um, you cannot believe what I've been through in, in the last two years. It is, it is horrible. And it's being done to other women and other wives and other men who don't go along with the program. They are murdering Marines. They're murdering sailors. Of course, one of the best ways for you to stay alive is yes. to do what you're doing. Really? Reduce this, oh, absolutely. Reduce this to video. Get this scattered all over the country. They won't touch you because if you're dead, that validates everything you're saying. See? So. Well, they poison people. Publicity is the best thing you can yeah, do. Yeah. Um, one, one of the things that was happening to me after, oh, I must tell you about General Joy. Um, I found his name all through the diary. And what was really strange was that George had mentioned him earlier, early on in the marriage, but then after a certain incident at um, Camp Lejeune, which I think is very interesting relating to Tailhook and something that I did there. I'll, I'll tell you about that if I can remember. Um, I called. It took a lot for me to get General Joy's phone number. Uh -huh because the Marine colonels were not going to tell me because they knew I was investigating. Uh -huh. So nobody would tell me about General Joy. I called a person in George's address book who was a general pretending that you know I was updating my Christmas card list yeah. and I just wanted to find Jim Joy's telephone number. He said, oh, he's up there. He's running morale, welfare, recreation for the world, you know, a payoff job with uh -huh. the mob. Uh -huh. and, um, and he's uh, living outside of Quantico, and here's his phone number. So I call him up, and keep in mind, my husband is infamous, Princeton graduate, chief of staff for Al Gray, who runs all the dirty tricks for the Army. You know, Linda Tripp worked for Carl Steiner who was a partner of, um, you know, Jim Joy and Carl Steiner and my husband were the triumvirate in Beirut. Okay. And Linda Tripp worked for uh, Carl Steiner down there. In, this would be approximately? In the, I think in the, in the 80s. She, she and her husband were both Delta Force duos. They, they send them, but then they divorced, so that broke up that. Mm. But she, she's, a, she's a dirty tricks person. Linda. Anyway, so I call General Joy and I say, General Joy, um, this is Kay Griggs, and um, I'm George Griggs' wife, you know, chief of staff under Al Gray, head of half the world, dirty tricks, special operations, wet ops. And he, he goes, uh, no, I don't believe I know your husband. 
Exactly his words. Huh. And I'm taping it, by the way, because uh -huh. they, they, they took my tape. They started coming in and doing, putting sticky stuff and running my, you know, just mind, mind jagging me. Putting sticky stuff. On the tapes, and they would put the tapes on different, you know, they would go to a lot of trouble. They would take things that I said on one tape and put it on another. And, it, I mean, it was, they were having fun with me psychologically. Uh -huh. Um, but I taped this conversation with, with General Joy, and I said, well, that's, that's really strange, General Joy, that you don't know my husband, because um, I'm sitting here uh, on my bed, and I'm looking at my husband's diary that he kept the whole time he was in Beirut. And you're, you're in there on, almost on every page, you know, you're in there a lot. And you're going over to Cyprus and Rome, and you're, you know, getting money for weapons, and, you know, and then they're going to Tel Aviv, and they're doing this and that. And, um, and you know, I said, you mean you don't know my husband, George Griggs? And you're a Marine, and he's a colonel? He went, oh, that George Griggs. Because he knew I had the diary. I see. Then... He said, uh, oh, Ms. Griggs, uh, let, let me call you back. Let, let, you, let me call you back. So he had to confer with General Sheehan, General Joy, General Gaiman, General Hartzog, and his little cabal, particularly General Gray and General Krulak. So he called me back. And he was just like a little puppy dog. He said, oh, Ms. Griggs, I'm going to be in Norfolk uh, on the, uh, let's see, the night of the 5th, 6th, and 7th. I'll be at a morale welfare recreation meeting at the Marriott Hotel. And I would like to meet with you when I get there. You know, I'll be getting in around 5 o'clock. And I could meet, take, we could go to dinner or... You could come and have breakfast the next morning. We could eat, you know, blah, blah, blah. Or 11 o'clock, you know, now I have to speak at this luncheon engagement. You're welcome to, to come to that. Or we can meet at... He went through every hour of the whole time. He could not have been more insistent about meeting me if he'd, if he'd been my father, you know, my birthday or something. And um, so... So you did meet... I did, but I wasn't. I was afraid of him this because is, I knew he was General an assassin. Joy. General Jim Joy, the one who got Noriega out of Panama. Mm -hmm. He and Sheehan, the one who was behind the whole operation in Panama. This is a powerful guy. He and Carl Steiner, mm -hmm. Mutt and Jeff, Waco. They trained all the guys in Waco who went and did what they did to David Koresh. They're the ones behind all the black helicopters and Sheehan. They're the ones, you know, doing all the stuff down there mm -hmm. at Kathy McDaniel's down at, um, you know, in Fort Polk, Fort no, Hood. There's something new on me. Kathy McDaniel's? Kathy McDaniel's had a little talk show. She's a wife of... Um, the daughter of the mayor down there at Fort Polk. Okay. The little town outside of Fort Polk. And there were a lot of unusual things happening. And because she was talking about it, excuse me, they took her, her radio show off the air. And um, huh. they tried to, it's a long story, but anyway, so General Joy, I got in contact with the NCIS. That's Na Fort Naval Polk in Louisiana. Yeah. Uh -huh. Um, but I, I met with the NCIS guy and, um, uh, and a Marine that I just met cold call because I was kind of worried about what would happen to me, um, you know, meeting him. So may I, may I go to the ladies' room? Certainly, may. Matter of fact, Steve suggests I've that we break. I've had to sort of go to the late. That's why I've been sort of antsy. Steve <laughs> suggests we break at five after, and, and uh, I think it's a good idea. Let's let's break and um, and we'll pick up right where. We're
Just a little bit of a recap here. All right, a little bit about your background, uh, about the psychological profile that these guys look for. Um, let's see, we're, we've discussed the, uh, the diary. We've discussed uh, Kadak and uh, Alexander... Um, Robinson. Robinson, couldn't read my writing, thank you. Um, and... Uh, I have a picture of Kadak. Yes, I noted that. We're going to inject that. We'll inject. In fact, we should we should have a little session here where we just go through pictures at the tail end yeah. of this. Yeah. Uh, pictures, picture, 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 picture. Yeah. Um, we discussed uh, tail hook and. Uh, uh, you know what tail hook means, don't you? No, what is tail hook? <laughs> uh oh, I got a feeling. Yeah. <laughs> is, is it a homosexual reference? Yeah, sure. Really? Sure. Did you sure. know that, Steve? <laughs> Isn't that something? Yeah. And the average person on the street has no idea. Yeah. You know, it's like Watergate. Well, the Watergate Hotel, that makes sense. And Tail Hook probably is some reference to, uh, you know, I honestly <laughs> thought it was. Um, well, when, see, when you refuel a jet it or is, something. It is, it is. But you, look, see, the, the planes look like this. Because, see, I was told this by, by Jerry Unruh. And Jerry Unruh was a captain when I met him. We were just partying. You know, I had a group of gals, and we were uh -huh. all school friends. And everybody hung around this place called Poppy's in Virginia Beach. It was the place in the, in the mid-'80s when uh -huh. I was at the Virginia Center for World Trade. Well, he, Jerry was in there. Um, he's an intelligence operative with uh, Scrocoff, Crow, you know, this whole McFarlane, Ed Wilson, who's a really good friend of my husband's, who's a really bad guy. Anyway, they're all... Do, some of them are doing this Rush River Lodge thing, you know, which Angleton was doing, where Woodward would go to these big orgy parties. Uh -huh. And George went to a few of those. But this, you see, is the, the plane, and it kind of looks like that. Okay. And yeah. it refuels. Uh -huh. See, that's what the hook is for. That's refuel. called the tail hook. Yes. Uh -huh. But it has a double meaning. A double entendre, sure. Because the tail... And I went to the preceding show two weeks ago and they had the tail hook booth and I have some stuff I don't think I have it with me but tail hook souvenirs because they are really trying to promote uh -huh. that you know the charitable function of that organization yes of course yeah. now the fact that that cover got blown on those tail hook uh, things that Paula was Cogan. a major snafu right uh, she had to try very hard to get that out that was at Camp Lejeune? No, it, I think it was um, in Las Vegas. Okay. But, oh, my thing went on in Camp Lejeune before Tailhook, and this is why I got flagged. Oh. Because I stopped all the go-go dancers in the offices clubs, and they got very mad with me. Ooh. I can tell you that story. It's true. Yeah, but why, um, you didn't realize what you are doing at the no, time? No, I was just incensed, you know, that they would allow topless um, women, young girls, in the officers' club dining room while I was trying to eat late one night. And George says, well, you know, you just have to get used to it. If you think this is anything, you ought, you ought to see what goes on in Okinawa. Well, this was, this was uh, 91. 90, it was before tail hook. And the Lord is always with me. Sometimes I don't know where he is, but this particular night, it was about 9 o'clock, and I was starving. And I was really mad because his reaction wasn't, um, I'm sorry, this, you know, this is offensive. Do you want to go in town to eat or something? He didn't do that. He attacked me. It was a chance to... Educate me the way they were educated. I see. Get yeah. used to it, bitch. You know, yeah. excuse my French. Yes, sir. But that's really what he was trying to do. Well, they were all young married officers. Now, I worked at the chamber, and this is taxpayer money. This looks bad. They had, you know, wedding bands on. And, and one of the guys, two of the guys goes out with one of the girls. So I'm going, after having said... Don't you see anything wrong with this picture? Uh -huh. And getting no background. I thought, oh, boy, I've got a camera in my pocketbook. 
I am going to see Marty and Oogie, my old roommate from St. Mary's, little Episcopal Junior College in Raleigh, North Carolina. And I said, whoa, little Lucille Ball comes out. And I just kind of grab that little camera with the flash, and I get me three little flashes of scattering people. So Just light. because the camera's going off. Yes. So that said to me, it proved to him, God, truth is light, light is truth. You know, hey, this isn't, I mean, God proved it. Mm -hmm. I didn't do it. I didn't argue. I just took pictures. They scattered. Then what happened? What happened to the pictures? Well, he, I, he tried to grab my camera. He? My husband. Right. But there were still some men in there, you see, and two of the girls. And they were looking at me like, you are the girls were probably thinking, oh, you know, but the guys, they, they, they saw older colonel, chief of staff here, wife. It was bad from the perspective of me being a wife, witnessing this, being ordered to, to shut up. Uh -huh. So I took the camera when he wanted to grab it from me, and I went like this. I mean, it was real battle time, major. My brother was a championship wrestler. You know, and I don't know anything about holes, but I knew this was self-preservation time. And I just said, well, I'm going to the ladies' room, huh? Yeah. So I went to the ladies' room, and I hid the darn thing. And um, he wanted to know where it was. We had a major battle. But th the end thing that happened was I wrote a nice letter, found out the name of the manager of the club, because I knew protocol. I knew you can't go and just really mess everybody up. And I sent a letter saying, is this normal mm -hmm. to, to have it, to the club manager. But I sent copies of the pictures and the letter to the wife of the general commander of the base and the wife of the commandant. Oh, man. You wanted to get in trouble. With the pictures. Uh-huh. No, I mean, I... Oh, you thought you were... Gonna... Helping the wives. Yeah. The wives, See, at this point, no doubt, are privy to all this stuff, right? Yeah. See, I thought, in the real world, this is what you do. Somebody... Uh -huh. But what happened was I went home, and the wives were meeting there, and I, I told them what I had done, and Carol and Millis said, Oh, no, you didn't do that, did you? George won't get promoted. You know, he was trying to make general... Uh -huh. But Louis Buell had already died. He wouldn't have made general anyway because of Sue. I already found out about that. But I didn't know that at the time. Uh -huh. so, but Charlotte Moore, whose family are better educated, and she's kind of the leader of the pack because she's, she's more rational than the rest of the wives, she said, Kay, thank you very much. We appreciate what you did for us. And then all the rest of them kind of, ch you know, they're like little puppets, too. But then I found out from Brooks West that I was, I was flagged, that General Gray had me marked as a troublemaker. Gotcha. So after that, no more stories while he's drinking. You know, it, it, uh, it was a very, he was having to balance them and me. You know, he was, um, I think he was challenged by me because he, you know, he knew that I was a free spirit. He didn't understand Christ. He didn't understand what, what my boundaries are. But he, because he was a little bit intimidated by my, my sense of freedom and my, you know, openness, mm -hmm. which comes from a, a complete understanding of where Christ is in my life, you know, mm -hmm. and I do, I follow in his footsteps, and, but I'm, I'm a free spirit because I'm created independently, as mm -hmm. we all are, and um, he never had, my husband never had that ability to, um, to be free from well, the time because, he was a teenager. Because early on, he was made captive to these other yes. uh, matters, yes. homosexual counters and the, the shame that that brings and the control so he was a, a bent twig That's early it. on yeah and he had the the Saudis uh, were beginning to pile into 
Russell House at the Hun School in Princeton, which is the school that my husband was, was in for four years on scholarship. He never saw his parents in eight years. Now think about this. His parents were shipped to California, I believe strategically so that they could control his mind. Okay. Um, he was too poor to fly out there. I think he did go one time when he was ROTC on a flight that took him forever and a day to get out there. Um, but he, um, he had a, uh, an uncle later on who bought a, a house in Princeton when he was in college. So he had a little bit of, of nurturing. And this uncle became his father. Okay. And this uncle's two sons and the next door neighbor, the next door neighbor became his wife. He knew he had to marry because of what he had gone through and it was I think so shameful and so hard on him that he he married um, right at graduation day practically from Princeton uh -huh. University where he had four years in ROTC and he was in the cap and gown club which uh, as I mentioned before is an intelligent sort of uh, football kind of scholarship club but what's interesting is my uncle, who was in intelligence, Ben Delaney, went through exactly the same hoops. I was thinking, you know, when I met my husband, this is, and it probably was God in, in many ways, but I thought, isn't it amazing that Uncle Ben, who was the football quarterback star for Princeton, the one year they won the whole national thing, he was... Um, he went to the Hun School. His father and mother were both killed or something happened to them. And I think they were a fairly well-to-do, prominent family. He was handsome, wonderful, just, just a neat man. So he went on scholarship to the Hun. And then, and he went in with crew and all these other things. He was in cap and gown. He was... Uh, he played on the football team. He wasn't a cheerleader. My husband was, was a cheerleader. But they were, ex they were in exactly the same pattern. ROTC scholarship. They went left ROTC. They were dependent on the government, on the intelligence community, you know, selling mm -hmm. weapons to whatever country. I know the country, but in other words, they were doing... Um, work for the joint under the table all these years. Okay, and directly under whose, uh, whose instructions to sell these weapons? Do you know that? Yeah. Okay, who would that be? Well, uh, it's, it's the Israeli uh, Zionist group in New York. Uh, Mossad? No. Well, what were yeah, terms? but everybody thinks Mossad like they think CIA is just a bogus sort of thing. Um, it's really Army intelligence that does just about everything. They, they run this, a lot of the psychological profiling, it, which is done at Quantico with the FBI. It's, it's all a very small group, Harvard professors connected with, you know, the Tavistock and Dar es Salaam, and there's a uh, sexual perversion group in Vienna and one in... in Colorado. I think that little girl was part of that experiment. You know who the was John Benet Ramsey? Ran yeah, Ramsey? yeah. Because I had some. Well, you know that raises an interesting point because here's a high-profile murder that goes nowhere. No investigation. She's, nobody's pinned. It just goes on and on and on. The parents are involved in that program. But somebody higher up level. is protecting them. Absolutely. And the same thing that you're describing about the military. Sure. If you're in the clique you can get away with murder. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Murder, literally murder. Uh -huh. um, and I had a, a group of visitors. I, I used to be set up by the State Department, my husband, who had power in the State Department. 
through, um, through both Caspar Weinberger and, um, well, his whole crowd. They, I mean, Caspar Weinberger, George Bush, Colby, Casey. My husband was in that clique. He was in the, in the Princeton uh, Marine Corps clique. Rob, Warner, you know. You tell me Senator Rob. Yeah, they're Warner. all Marines. Mm -hmm. Pat Robertson, all fourth Marines. I mean, they're all involved in this. They know, it, they're running everything. Now, you mentioned Pat Robertson. You're talking about the 700 Club, uh -huh. Pat Robertson. Uh -huh. okay. Yeah, there's a power thing there. And it's all male, it's all white, and they're, they do, they know the murders are going on. They're surgical, they're strategic, they're political. But um, uh, what I was going to tell you is I was used because I was the most gullible in high school. And I'm very, very um, spiritual, and uh, I love people. So, and I, I was driven to meet all these people from all over the world for some reason. Um, so they would feed me people because they knew I would react. It's kind of like Monica and Bill. I think they put Monica in there to have something on Bill. That's my own feeling. Mm -hmm. Sarah McClendon feels the same way. Uh -huh. Because and Linda Tripp was there to guide the situation. Absolutely, of course. Linda Tripp was Delta Force. Linda Tripp was trained by Carl Steiner, who's in the diary with my husband. Carl Steiner is called a snake, and he tried to trip up a uh, Schwarzkopf. I mean, he was trying to take to take the whole Iraqi thing over because they had been baiting, you know, using their the Israeli rogues in. Um, Turkey, they were having little zigzag wars. It's all to sell weapons. It's, it's, all, it's all about weapon sales. It's all about drugs. It's all about funny money. Making money. Of course. And the, the head, Krulak, who is the Commandant of the Marine Corps, his father, Victor Krulak, worked with this Russian, uh, Czechoslovakian double agent, who was uh, worked with um, Al Gray, who was enlisted at that time, rose right up to the top because they were involved with Butcher and this whole crowd um, that was um, trying to pick fights. Mm -hmm. and, and they were not, they were Army and Navy together, mm -hmm. joint. And um, George kept saying, George calls them the members of the firm. He calls them the members of the firm. I've heard the Brotherhood. Um, they're very close. And it's, it's a small group, and it's very hierarchical. I had Casper Weinberger's bodyguard farm me when I was at Sarah McClendon's. Now, farm you. Yeah, that's a term that, that they use. Where they cultivate? They cult Well, not cultivate, but just want to find out kind of... They're doing profiling on me. Women are hard to profile because we're, we're very easy. We, we're very easy if you understand women. And I think they need more women in human intelligence because um, we'd solve a lot of these problems like overpopulation or whatever it is very quickly. Because we... we, we we're the ones who teach the men how to talk, how to communicate. We think on 20 levels at once. You know, we're very spiritual. We're very practical all at the same time. And they make mistakes by pegging women as crazy when really they're very anxious to solve problems. They're just very frustrated to see a lot of wacko things going on that don't need to be going on, but the guys don't see it. So with, with my husband... Um, uh, and so forth. I was used, um, they profiled me, they knew I loved international people because I'd already demonstrated that. And there was a group of sexual um, psychologists, psychiatrists from Vienna who came over. I have pictures of them. I was their escort. George was already gone and I was intrigued that they were still sending me people. Okay, now you referred to them as sexual psychologists? Yeah, there's a whole, whole range of, of psychiatrists who study perversion, okay. sexual perversion. Harvard, 
um, Yale, Johns Hopkins, and this Colorado group, Dar es Salaam, uh, where they trained the African, the black African uh, terrorists. Um, they trained them in inter interrogation. They trained the JAGs in interrogation methods and so forth. And a lot of these guys got their experience in, v in Vietnam. Intentionally, they took these little boys. That's what they're doing in Bosnia right now. They're training future um, leaders. In, in perversion. Um, they have a school, they have a, the British have a school that George was working with in Indonesia for a year. My husband was setting up a, the, there, there was already a program on East Timor, a little place there in the mountains that had been set up by the Australians during World War II. It was involved, I think, with Burma and, you know, some of the, the killings that were going on in China and so forth. Mm -hmm. That Parker Host, T. Parker Host, this man who now controls my husband with, with Bob Edwards. Um, T. Parker Host, this is how they got together. T. Parker Host, I knew when I was the assistant director of the Virginia Center for World Trade. I was the first woman on the board of the Foreign Commerce Club. I was uh, very involved politically, and I was having a ball. Um, and I met um, T. Parker Host through someone else. I was the chairman of a board of um, all these international shippers and brokers. I was just a, you know, sort of a glorified secretary, public relations person. Now, T. Parker Host was the Finnish consul and the, um, he, at one time he'd been the Norwegian consul, the Icelandic consul. I thought he was a really nice guy because he was outgoing, he seemed Virginian. I didn't know that much about him. But it turns out he, he has one shipping agency when I meet him in 85. He knows my husband's profession instantly because he brags about being with the mobs. He, the mob runs the port of Norfolk. The, the I, I, I mean, it's terrible to say, the bankers and then that. Then they have the, this is not, I can't say that. You can't say what? No. It's, the, the ports are run by, it's a homosexual hierarchy. Okay, it makes sense. That's, that's not an objection. Well, okay. And in Norfolk, it's Walter Chrysler, Phil Hornthal. You know, they have the rich ones, and then they, they get the little ones in by introducing them to the, to the big guys. It's like George met Einstein. Einstein was in that little, little ring that the Saudis were in. It was a very elite. No, Camus. you're saying Einstein? Albert Einstein okay. was, was in that little Princeton ring before he died. And okay. George, they, they partied mm -hmm. together. Um, anyway... So the Norfolk um, crowd runs the port. It's very organized and so forth. Um, and I knew the person who was running the Maritime Association Shipping Agency, very nice man who was that way. Um, but I didn't know it, you know. I, I went out with him. I like him very much. I mean, he's a very nice person. But I, you know, and I... And completely homosexual. Completely. But... But he liked me, and I thought he was wonderful. Many homosexuals are very yeah. He's a very, people. very nice guy. Well, um, his best friend was T. Parker Host. Park, he lived with him for a while. Well, I didn't think anything about Parker because you know he'd been married and had a couple of sons, and I thought, well, you know, this is just a guy who's moved away from Newport News for some reason and settled in Norfolk. I thought it was unusual. He didn't have any friends. You know, I didn't know. And, but it wasn't because of that. It was because Parker um, had some questionable um, associations with mob figures, with um, assassins. He was in the Burma Special Operations Command. He, he liked 
being living a dangerous life, and he bragged about it mm -hmm. to others. Mm -hmm. uh, my husband and he gra gravitated to one another. And um, I thought it was wonderful because my husband didn't seem to have any friends. So I sort of fixed him up with Parker. <laughs> well, Parker's the one who did me in, <laughs> you know. Uh -huh. <clears throat> Parker plotted, and it's a long story, but basically, and this sounds petty, but I wouldn't go out with him. And, and I'm not saying I did anything that was, it's just that he wasn't my type. Mm -hmm. Obviously. You know, well, I mean, not, but he just was, he's boorish, he's loud, he's... Uh -huh kind of rude. So you're saying even just in a social context? Yeah. Just so what happened was, because my husband is so close to Bush and McFarland and Scrocoft and all mm -hmm. these guys, Parker starts getting in with my husband's friends and cultivating them. And he goes from having one shipping agency to dot it all over the place. He goes from being a Democrat in petty little Virginia politics and being the Icelandic Finnish consul to having big shipping deals going through Iceland and Finland and Norway. And my husband's setting up deals in Moss, Norway, which I was the president of the Sister City Association. I was being used while my husband, while they were setting up, you know, shipment places, transshipment places. So, I mean, I was wit witnessing all of this, and it all came back to, to me, just boom, like that. But Parker, it was so interesting. We had a hearing. I had a hearing with my husband. That very day, George Bush was in town. My husband was in town. My home was broken into while I was in court. Very strategically, I was called by a Marine colonel named Jack, who is very involved with the maritime shipping business, and he knew that I know a lot about that. He called me and invited me as a guest of his to attend the George Bush um, huge banquet with John Warner while my house was being robbed. My car was sabotaged that day. And guess who introduced George Bush? T. Parker Host. Now, he made it to the big time. You know, Alexander Haig is another one. You can help us out any coffee Thank or anything you. about that. Um, yeah, he's a friend. Alexander Haig, he, he rose from nothing to top dog just overnight. That's because he's in the club. Oh, of course uh, he's in the club. Now, how he's in the club, you see. Now, all these guys. Henry Kissinger, Heinz Kissinger. Oh, I have a story. This. Oh, we all suspect Henry's a queer. Oh, but yeah, I have a, a first... I have a first-hand story from Bob, who was there in Cambodia with Heinz. Okay, you call him Heinz. Henry. Yeah, okay. Heinz. His real name is Heinz Kissinger. Okay. 